Hello all, I'm Arifa Akbar, good evening. Um, I'm the Chief Theatre Critic at The Guardian. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this event on International Women's Day. And it, this kicks off a, a week-long series called Insights at the Royal Opera House. And it's a returning series. It looks at women in the creative industries. What impact ha have they had on the arts to date? What needs to change? What active steps can be taken towards that change? Um, how do we make gender parity happen in the, in the creative industry and as in society at large? So a few indications about how things aren't quite there yet, and I'm going to be very brief, but um, a few sort of factoids. So of all the artistic directors, um, leading theatres, UK theatres at the moment, there's 36% of them are women. 33% of the board members on those on those theatre boards are, are women, 33%. Uh, within, I'm very reliably informed by the Royal Opera House that in its history there have been three operas by female composers. Yeah, and um, which, which stunned and appalled me slightly. Uh, within arts regeneration, we, we're dangerously underrepresented. You know, the cultural renewal um, task force, which is the task force uh, for cut to take us all, the government's task force that takes us all through um, the pandemic, cultural renewal through the pandemic. There's no significant lead the women within its leadership. Um, and there are three women on the task force as a whole, three of them. Um, and the pandemic seems to have Ex exacerbated inequalities across the board and there's evidence that strongly suggests that women are going to be at the brunt of it or if they or aren't already um, women tend to be carers part-time workers freelance workers and those are the, the the biggest sort of groups affected it's not all doom and gloom we've got a, an incredibly illustrious panel to present all sides i think um and we've got they'll be in conversation together and with me for for about a half half an hour about 30 minutes and then we'd like to open up questions to you too uh, in the last 15 minutes and so to that end would you anybody who has a question at any point would you jot it in the chat function we have a team uh, looking through that chat function and taking questions mm. along the way so you can leave at any point and we'll hope to put those questions to 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 the panel either in you know specific questions or for them all so feel free now i want to have i'm going to make the quickest brief of it briefest of introductions uh, so we can get on with the meat of the night. Um, in alphabetical order, we have uh, Paulie Constable, Constable, who's an award-winning lighting designer for opera, theatre, dance. We have Frances Morris, who's a curator, writer, and director of the Tate Modern, the first female of dire of, uh, uh, director of Tate Modern, which has been there since 2016. We have Indu Ruba Singham, who's the artistic director of the Kiln Theatre, um, where she's been since 2012 and has done great things. I say that as somebody in, in the industry. She's also a trustee of the Royal Opera House. And we have Priti Yende, who's a South African soprano who made her debut at the Royal Opera House in 2017, but has performed, you know, everywhere from La Scala, Milan to, to New York, to Paris, to Berlin, and is currently joining us from Vienna. And we're really international here. Francis is, is, has um, dialed in from New York. We've got uh, Paulie from Brighton. We've got Indu and me in London. So, so one of the few joys of, of Zoom. Could I, to just to push off, uh, pose uh, just two questions, a positive and a negative, at all of you? And if we could just spend a, a minute or two on, 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 on this, and then perhaps this will anchor us for the next 30 minutes, because I want to ask you what you think in your respective sectors, what is, what's the greatest stride made forward in the last 10 years, do you think, in your world, in your professional world? A, and then B, part, second part of the question, what's the biggest hurdle? So what, what's the, the challenge, the intransigent thing, that, that, that immovable thing that you find especially frustrating? So positive and, po positive and negative, go for it. Who's first? 
You are. <laughs> okay, get it over with. Okay, so, so this is an example of what's fantastic. Um, you know, I feel part of a generation of amazing women. Many, most of whom are younger, so it's not quite the generation, but there's, there's been a sea change in uh, the voice and agency and power and uh, presence of women in the visual arts. And I think that is reflected in the incredible proliferation over the last 10 years of great revelatory exhibitions of overlooked women artists and the fact that they're normal. They're normalised. You know, it is. It is. It's no longer the case that people remark. Sunday Times critics don't remark endlessly on a sort of skewed program, and it's that's embedded and that's wonderful. But there is a really big but, and that but speaks to your comment about only through great opera composers being women is actually that the impact this has on the kind of um, system. Is, is minimal. It's con you can change content, but it's very difficult to change values, judgments, hierarchies. Um, we've got 300 years of histories of patriarchy and race to play with. And, you know, when you look at the last 10 years and you see every year that top 100 of artists in the sales index, they're never more than 2% of those that are women. So we proliferate, but we don't achieve the, the heights. And that's a real problem. Yeah. Thanks, Francis. Indu. Um, yeah. Um, so in terms of the last 10 years, one of the greatest achievements, I think, is exactly what I mean, that statistic that you sort of said at the beginning as a as a negative uh, in terms of 33 percent of leadership um, uh, uh, being women. Yes, it's not 50 percent or uh, that. But I would say that's probably majority of that statistic has happened in the last 10 years so seeing that that leader seeing many more women in across the industry in leadership positions has been I think one of the um the 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 biggest strides um and I would sort of say with my butt to that is that um the exposure um to female leaders and um and we see that across in um uh, in all fields not just in the arts but look at what happens to female politicians as opposed to the male politicians in terms of the uh the vitriol or the 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 grief that 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 they they're, they're given and uh, and i think I, what i worry about in the future is who's going to want to take up leadership positions and deal with all that um in the future I yeah I really yeah that's you know it's going to be those that are power mad yeah yeah great okay well not great but thank you uh Pauli yeah I think uh, a little bit like Francis and Indu I think the quality of the the sort of wagon train we've been able to build around ourselves has improved and we found more like-minded um colleagues collaborators um employers you know we, we were making networks but I did think when I saw the question I find it very hard to say what really has changed in the last 10 years I look at my younger self I look at people in the same position as me particularly going into what remains an incredibly male dominated part of the industry the sort of technical creative part of the live performing arts you know we're still in an absolute minority and until the the values that we that we hold close genuinely change that is not going to alter you know until it's really not seen as you know until we look at, at, at you know ideas of job sharing the way we value how people work the way we value people's contributions to a working situation mm -hmm. nothing is going to change so it feels like it's all about our vulnerability at the moment and that's not really been i think closely engaged with so you are yes and that really chimes with francis's you know the content might have changed but the hierarchies and systems are still there yeah. thank you uh, pretty i can absolutely agree with you ladies i mean i still consider myself as a young artist because um, my career is still budding but in the last 10 years i have seen little, little change to seeing many women on that side of the table in the, you know, in the director, for example, or the conductor, you know. So normally when you have that, it's only one person or none at all. And uh, as far as 
a big part, which is something that I saw even when I came, is the lack of um, inclusivity about each and every person's uniqueness. We as artists, we embody the characters, but we are not built the same way, for example. So we are always, in a way, finding ourselves as women forced to look a certain way and not being embraced by who we really are. For example, I'm an African woman <laughs> and uh, I have my body shape and I can never be, you know, another. And that actually affects my, my confidence. It affects my, uh, my instrument because my instrument is not just the vocal cords, but the entirety of me being, feeling, you know, in power as a woman and uh, as unique as I am. So there's a long way. I can tell so many stories of uh, fans who actually write to me and thanking me for having courage to, to, to stay authentic to who I am and not, uh, you know, but it's not easy. I have to say it's not easy because, you know, that's just an, an incredible um, burden for us as artists and as women. And that, that, again, that chimes with Indu's, you know, vitriol on the way that women um, it, in the spotlight are, are regarded, just the scrutiny you're talking, you know, the, the scrutiny and sort of the vigilance of women's bodies and all the rest of performance. So, yeah. so isn't, it, isn't it also, just to, if I can chip in, yeah. I'm picking up on Paula's point, it's a, a lack of respect yes. for the way women might want or need to live their lives and perform their professional careers differently because of who they are. And I was very struck, um, you know, there's been a lot of press over the weekend around International Women's Day and, and gender issues, but there was a really telling piece, two pieces in the Sunday Times by the arts critic, where he was doing a little bit of a, like a, a reopening and what to look out for. And you always look at those things when you're in a you know, um, when you think about box office and two great projects we've got coming up, Kusama, Yayu Kusama and uh, Zanei Mahali were flagged as, you know, ones to watch. And both of those artists' practice came out of participatory practice, socially engaged, deeply politically um, activist uh, artists in their different modes and different eras. And celebrated by this critic, on the very next page, he was castigating participatory practice as somehow lesser and say, we need, you know, put painting back in the spotlight. And I just thought there's a paradox here that these people make great art, but the way they make it is not respected for what it really is. So there's a, we're a kind of out of syncness here. Or you're saying that women who do choose a practice that, that goes against co conventional practice um, and, and rise in their field are sort of congratulated, but actually not... But the, but the practice itself is always considered as lesser. And that's what I mean about we have to change the system. Yes, and, and let's, let's, decon let's try and home in on the system then. Let's think about the pipeline that leads from entry level positions, you know, people full of hope, young people full of hope, wanting to enter the visual arts and be curators or wanting to get into theatre, um, to, to uh, along that pipeline, to those leadership roles that, that some of you have spoken of. Where is the breakage? Where's the leak in your particular fields? So where's the bit that stops the blockage, that stops women from being channeled into that pipeline upwards to those boards, to those the positions that you hold? What do you believe? Where, you're um, pretty. I believe it's just, the, I mean, um, it's the misconception that we are not good enough in a leadership position, you know, which is a, a society problem that has always viewed woman, a woman as a second human being, not as a first human being. So are you saying it's systemic, you know, how society yes. is the reflection of the, of the lack of leadership everywhere else? Basically, is that yes. it? Can we be more specific in our fields? You know, what do we not encourage enough people uh, at, at a certain age to, to join the visual arts? Is it hard for, for young women to enter the world of visual arts? Or are they left to languish in that entry level role? 
or is there a culture of there, there's a culture that sort of puts them off and, and you know you have these ta what were talented young women coming coming into a field and somehow get you know walking sideways and and and, and not really escalating up I mean, it, it, that's so it, it's a really such a good question it's so difficult to give a simple answer yes. and I think I, mean, I think pretty is right I think that systemic um, uh, gender bias is absolutely partly to account um, for the, the difficult pathway that women have but I also think that you know the the, the history of arts practice disinclines women from pursuing the kind of mainstream kind of top-notch studio practices that get you to the top of the marketplace you know the oil paintings or it's a very very gendered tradition so there is a tendency I mean again it's really interesting women have often been deflected from those um, conventional roles or they lack role models, they lack encouragement, they suffer. So they tend to take their creativity often to a marginal space where they do amazing things. And, you know, well, I always think like women, like mushrooms, they're on the margins, punching up through the soil, doing great things, but they never get to the center of the forest. They're hugely important for the ecosystem, but the men are the, the occupy the kind of, you know, the canopy. So how do we, what we need to do is, is revalue, put value back into those areas. Because we do are seeing the world through conventional eyes. So you're saying, so something like embroidery has been, it's regarded as a craft more than oh, an art. Oh, absolutely art. lesser, you know. And I, throughout my career, I've seen those, those things slowly shifting, but there's still a persistent lack of deep respect for, isn't it bizarre really, you know, processes that use your hands. I yes. mean, it's absolutely bonkers when you think about it, but it is deeply enshrined in a history which is played out over several hundred years. So, so the, the, to try and shift that, there's a lot at stake for people who've invested their lives and their energies writing those histories. You know, what, what we really kind of like, we need it almost like a sort of ecological moment for art we need to rewild it bring those things back into play mm -hmm. and actually understand how important they are i love and, that idea thank you. Rewild. Paul, yes poorly and into what's it like in the performing arts and theater well, you know i was just thinking that one of the things that is also really problematic in for example opera is that so much of the repertoire that we're engaging with has a very conventional and fixed idea of female in it within its repertoire itself and, you know, that can be exposed and explored. And there are directors within particularly some very, very strong female directors in, the, in who are doing that work. But the conventional idea of so many opera heroines is one that it's very, very difficult to engage with as a contemporary woman. And therefore, you sort of feel like the value, you know, there's the values within the, the system are ones that don't necessarily reflect the values that we hold as modern women. So where our voice sits within that, when we're also admiring people behaving and, and you know, conforming to ways of being that we're, we're pushing against, it's really hard because where, where does our voice sit within that? Um, so you're not, so you're saying something similar to Francis in that, uh, are you? Absolutely. But one of the problems, of course, with opera specifically is that we're not generating huge amounts of new opera. You know, a oh. lot of opera is, is dependent upon a, a canon which is three, four hundred years old. And, you know, and we're looking at, we're gazing at a different idea of what it is to be female. But is, so, is, I, whereas, well, whereas theatre has had gender reversal and it's had those inversions, you know, it's, it's had women playing male roles, that, that just hasn't arrived at opera has it well no we did i mean obviously with baroque opera we have a lot of men singing women's roles women singing men's roles okay. of course but i mean that you, you know it's funny with handel that gender you know a lot of gender gets played with but it's just the idea of what women are i think is quite often kind of very conventional within the opera repertoire and i think that makes it 
tricky. And I think creating a new opera, there's a lot of investment and resources that need to go into that in, as opposed to, say, a new play. And it's also, so in a way, one of my biggest questions, or one of the, I think one of the biggest barriers is where does power lie? Where do the resources lie? Who, who, who distributes the money, the funding, and how do you get access to that? So I think that there's a lot of systemic institutional both patriarchy and racism within within our funding, you know, that ha wh who has the money and how that is distributed. And uh, so I think I think that the barrier to the barrier in terms of leadership or into um, into the mainstream, as opposed to valuing the, the outer uh, the outer regions as so as the mushrooms, as Francis so sort of uh, put it, is is actually who who's holding the power and who would and where do they not want to let it go absolutely and who's holding the power are often the people in the boardrooms and we know that you know as i've just said three out of ten people are, are women holding the power and the rest of the men uh, and that's an improvement as you say and do so do we need something as basic as quota systems at the highest levels we talk about quota systems and entry levels do we need quota systems up top can I say, I know Pretty wants to say something. Can I just, oh. I want to just add before we get to the quota yes. system, because I don't, it's not just about the people who hold the power. Because one of the things that in my area is that we are very dependent on box office, which isn't subsidy, it's actually people electing to spend money to see stuff. And I can do a 50 50 program of women and men, but the box office will be owned by the men. And actually, that is a real problem that the, the, the and, and that runs right through our programs that you can how you can you can do a quota system, but the driving audiences or pulling audiences in, into what you do, it, it takes a very, very long time to change. Right. Uh, pretty. No, I wanted to just say to Paula, because I, I was very inspired by these women in a way. And as an actress, I've been fascinated about the difference, you know, that they, they the, the, the possibilities that I have right now that they never had. Mm. I can choose, I can, you know, determine my future and all that. But at the very same time, I have been finding inspiration in terms of how I portray them. Actually, most of them have almost gotten too strong <laughs> because I believe that in a way there is so many ways to 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 um to express emotions and to almost also pull the human being up you know in a way so in a way I, I I've, I've been trying to do that mostly in my performances so I just wanted to say that that's really interesting that you're sort yeah of because they always portray the very of yeah yeah. those conventional roles which which is an interesting thing to do from within um oh and and i want to talk just to move on and i know i've just thrown a question about you know quota and do we need level but i think francis sort of kind of addressed it and you've all said quota systems in themselves aren't enough because what you need to uh, really address is the structure of the system yeah. um as women who are um minorities in your in your fields it just being the first you know you've somehow cracked the glass ceiling and there you are head above it um and how does it feel to be there you know above the glass ceiling you've broken it in your respective fields and how how do you and others like you build networks of power and connection so that you're not one of the only ones there in another 10 20 30 years i mean it's a question Difficult question. <laughs> I think you break the glass ceiling and then there's another glass ceiling. Yeah. Yes. You but know, I, that's, that's the really weird thing is that there's always another challenge. Um, but I, we would, but just before we went live, we were talking about there was nothing good about Zoom. Zoom, I think, has been amazing for networking. And I I've, I've have had the pleasure in lockdown of actually just deciding who do I want to connect with that I've never met before and reaching out. And I think it's that I found such a, I dare I say, spirit of sisterhood across the world in the visual arts that I just, it has been the best thing. I really almost makes me want to weep actually that I just feel, you know, 
I've connected with colleagues in Australia and Africa, across the Americas and Latin America. And it, it, that has been extraordinary. Fantastic. The I others. Think, yeah, I think, I think when you say what, how does it feel to be, you know, I'd say exhausted. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and there's been a cost. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, I think, I think, yeah, it's great to sort of say that you've broken the glass ceiling or you're, you're one of the first or whatever that is. But, but when you, when I personally look at it, I look at it that, that, that has come with a great cost and it's like, how do you make sure, I think when I'm looking, looking at it in other ways is how do you make sure that cost isn't there so much for people coming up? Because yeah, you know, it's 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 great to have resilience, but to have to build up that resilience in, in order to have a career is quite tough going. Yeah. I completely agree, Indu. And I think also, I, I mean, I think I think there does there's a, a I realized about 10 years ago there was a big responsibility in terms of trying to find my voice outside of my work. So find a voice that has an element of encouragement I don't know whether it's being an encourage in, to encourage people to be a role model to to step into spaces where I feel vulnerable because it will help to be for, for that role being fulfilled by a woman to be seen of course there's a responsibility to do that but um you know at the same time you know going through massive physical changes that we go through as women as you're trying to do that that's been a, an absolute nightmare um, trying to keep your work going, trying to keep your sanity going, and and finding ways to be able to be vulnerable. I think that's so yeah. hard, and I mm. think that's what we need to allow ourselves, because I think we have to push. We have had to push, and we have to push. As you know, as Pretty is saying as well. You know, all of us. It feels so precarious and so vulnerable. And you want the end. Go. I was saying, and you can really see it in the pandemic. Did I, you know, you can see how immediately in a crisis we resort to old behaviours and old patterns, or you watch that happen in the, the in 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 our industry, which is kind of quite frightening because you kind of go, I thought we moved way beyond this, but you watch you watch certain things happen, and you kind of go, wow, it's it's like it's like we all need saving because we can't do it ourselves. Um, I want to pick up on what Paulie said in a minute, but do you feel that you, having cracked one glass ceiling, of course, encountering the next one up, do you feel that it's slightly easier for the women coming, um, you know, Helen Legg at the Liverpool Tate, you know, gallery, um, Tate, following you, um, uh, you know, Francis, or the younger artistic directors now coming through the bush or whatever into do you feel that there's a battle that 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 there's certain battles being won and it is easier for for the next lot to be coming through to leadership i, I think it is but i also think you know I'm, i am conscious too that um as others have just said that there is a cost and those who follow us are aware of that cost because they see it mm. And they see it in you know, the people I work with, see the stress. And um, so I think, you know, it's, it's a kind of, I'm, I'm a great believer in being totally honest. And yet I occasionally think, you know, you, well, you've got to frame this. You've got to be encouraging as well. But I think, it, I think it, it will be easier for them. But I also, as I said, I think, you know, there is another glass ceiling. I'm very conscious that, you know, beyond being a director, then there's a board. And the board is a different thing. And beyond the board, there's the DCMS. And beyond the, you know, the DCMS is part of the government. And we're talking about, you know, the closer you get to the, the center of power, the more conventional, the more patriarchy that it, yeah. and I, I actually, I think one of the, talking about the last 10 years, I'm not sure we've ever been in such a fraught situation with our governmental leaders in relation to culture. It feels so, um, fragile and, and uh, there's so many uh, concerns there that, 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 that really worries me yeah. sorry pretty no i'm sorry i was i was just saying that i'm hopeful that we have you know broken some barriers you know and whoever's coming i, I know from most of the people who come from south africa 
the kind of hope that they got just because they saw me breaking through like mm. there's like thousands now that know that it's not impossible and the responsibility that now becomes mine unintentionally is to see what's next so that the person who comes behind doesn't have to do the same thing not only because i'm doing it for for whoever's coming back but because i believe we can make change we are making changes they might not look significant but i would like to believe that we are moving forward rather than backwards and i want to i actually in a minute i'll ask you about role models pretty you've just mentioned role models and somebody else mentioned mental mentors and i want to ask you about your your want to sort of get a little bit more personal before i do a couple of you mentioned or three of you the cost of this the cost again and again and and you know there's around there's childcare issues around being um, a, for some women. There's maternity issues. Uh, there's juggling home with work life. Um, there has has that improved? You know, even in terms of just just your contracts. You know, the contracts that you give out and and social policy. You know, has has your field accommodated? You know, what is ha, have you had to pay a cost of that juggling? I mean, I. I'll jump in there and say there is no, you know, as, as a creative in the arts, I have to necessarily work freelance. That's the only option for me. For freelance people, work the workforce in the in the performing arts, there are there is no safety net, there is no support. So you are uh, on your own as a carer in whatever form that might take. I mean, one of the things that the pandemic has really exposed is the precarity of the freelance life, and I think that gets harder and harder for anybody with caring responsibilities so until we start to really you know think about job shares and think about mm. that being completely normalized that actually everybody has other things in their life and also other expectations i, I don't think we we can move forward really in terms in terms of looking at any fairness no i, I would concur i mean i think uh, you know i'm a, in a very uh, privileged position being working for a national museum but when i look at the younger generation of artists male and female actually the the kind of um uh the opportunities they had to supplement work in the studio or social practice with teaching or mm -hmm. uh, art workers it, it, those those they are just diminishing by in, in in wave upon wave and i think it's a it's a it's a really really challenging moment for for the ecology um and and it's it's a matter of some urgency that as a sector we try and address that because if we don't support the next generation of artists what's the next generation of national museums and theatres and opera houses going to do mm. we're, we're now butting up against a time timer here which is frustrating because we had i had role models to ask you about but i'm going to put that to one side i'm going and i'm going to take audience begin to take audience questions which are coming in thick and fast thank you audience for that mm. before i do i do want to slip this one in and it's it's about power in the workplace and it's about you know that watershed or apparent what apparently watershed moment um of uh, harvey weinstein's uh, legal case and and court case and the me too movement that followed do we um is it easy and of course you know then the the film industry and to some degree the theater industry sort of having to look at itself and and ask uh, some some soul search and ask questions are we is the art sector making it easier to call these to call out bad behaviors ass assault uh, issues around consent um do, do you feel that women will you know post me to are gonna find it easier or is it not as simple as that and once again we're up against a system where if you're a freelance actor or a freelance whatever you actually you just want work and you can't afford to become a nuisance or become a telltale or speak out I would say that within institutions, the situation is markedly improved in that there is a culture of transparency and um, cultures of dignity and respect that, that are part of the 
uh, where working now, but I have, I, I, you know, there are the outside those institutional areas, areas of freelance where, where often careers are massively shaped by power relationships. You know, who knows? I think the world is still a very scary and unequal place. Working at, I mean, poorly, particularly working in an industry that is sort of so heavily, 70% um, of it is dependent, is a freelance industry. And how, and also, but coupled with that, it's to make a show, to make a play, um, it relies on and people trust and vulnerability uh, mm -hmm. immediately in order to, that, that's what's wonderful about being in a rehearsal room with actors mm -hmm. is like they jump in and they, and they get on with it but that that is also ripe that's a, a for a situation of of different power structures and mm. you know I think I think there's a lot more awareness and I think there's a lot more consciousness in trying to address it but I think it's not as straightforward as just being able to call it out or being able because people need work people their reputations people talk and people you know it's yeah. uh, it's it's how how safe and fair can we make our industry yes and there seems you're saying there's a lot at stake for people who do women who do speak out um can i very quickly now abort all my questions apart from if you had to take one action tomorrow to change you know our world for the better for for the betterment of gender parity what would you do you know in a couple of words simple as that if you could click your fingers or do one thing tomorrow I would find a medical solution for imposter syndrome for women. Good one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's brilliant, Francis. Yes. I'm absolutely going for that. I'm going to be in the <laughs> clinical trials, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> There's a call out to doctors everywhere. <laughs> if anyone else, no one else has any other inspiration, then we're going to begin to take audience questions now. So there's Marina O'Callaghan, thank you for your question. Would the panel tell us how they feel female creatives have fared during this pandemic? I especially ask regarding female actors and backstage personnel. We haven't really talked about backstage, so. Um, I mean, the, the, the truth is what we all know about the pandemic pandemic is that women have on the brunt of it in terms of caring, homeschooling, being in more precarious positions anyway, having uh, lower incomes anyway, because, you know, I was thinking, would anybody um, mention the kind of Equal Pay Act and the fact that it hasn't reached into our industry. So the thing that really scares me is very much what Francis was saying, that on the other side of this, any, any, you know, progress we've been making in terms of gender parity, but also in terms of for any marginalised communities in the performing arts, we are hugely, hugely vulnerable. And it's the freelancers who carry all of that, or the majority of that, and that, you know, many, many people will not be, uh, we've lost thousands. And the majority of those are younger artists, probably younger non-white parts of the workforce, and the women, you know, it's that's the truth of it they're the people who will not be coming back mm. totally agree and also it's um you know who's going to choose to come come into this career knowing it's so precarious who's going to engage with it who where, what, what's going to happen to the pipeline uh, who's going to go to the drama schools or the training or to the art schools and you know is it going to be those who've got who've got much more financial stability so what's going to happen to our whole cultural um, industries. And you'd like to think that the government would all, you know, values culture enough to safeguard in some way, but as Francis said, you know, a while ago, uh, we, we don't have full faith in that either, do we? But we're also talking about a government who are constantly talking about levelling up, and yet that's being complaid, paid complete lip service to in the, in the cultural industries. So at the moment, it feels like it's only an option for you if you have a safety net. Right. And yes, so the arts become for the privileged few, you know, yeah. rather than mm -hmm. a, a, a democratic. Uh, let's get on to the next question. Pretty, did you want to say anything? Or? No, 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 I was okay, agreeing. <laughs> so, so Anna Maria Gill, Anne Maria Gill, sorry, Anne Maria Gill is asking, if the panel were to redesign or dismantle the current unequal structure, so structures, how would they go about it? Mm. <laughs> Anything within that structure? 
Well, I think I, I think one of sorry, I think one of the things that um, we're beginning to think of at Taste, and I know I've talked to Paula about this, is is how do you shift the the focus from what we would call the blockbuster, and in theatre you would call the main stage, to other types of public engagement and creative practice that might suit a, suit women better. Um, and I, and that's both, it's, it's, th that is embed, how you embed that shift in the business model. So it really is about kind of structural shift. And I, we need to do a lot of work. There's a lot of work being done at the moment around you know, climate emergency that's looking at growth models. And I think we, we, you know, we, can, we can draw some analogies here. How do we move from that growth model to a model that actually suits women better, both as practitioners, professionals and audiences? I do three things. <laughs> I, get, I really transform chairs of boards, that, that, that there's a real diversity of chairs uh, across the sector. Um, um, look at giving much more priority and resources of, of the arts in education um, and um, introduce a universal uh, basic income. Hmm. Those are the three things. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how we dismantle the structure? I think you should be our next prime minister. <laughs> um, now, Catrion, Catriona's asked, do you have any thoughts on how we can help women progress into artistic leadership roles? Well, this is touching on what you just said, Indu. Um, can help women progress into artistic leadership roles as well as administra administrative? Um, as well as the intersection with Black Lives Matter and supporting BAME women in the arts. So how do we how, how do we progress that? How do we get, you know, BME women um, in the arts? How do we get them into artistic leadership roles? This is what we've sort of been grappling with, haven't we? Sort of getting women into leadership. Sorry, what are you going to say something? No, after you, Indy. Mm. I think, I think, I think one of the frustrations, and I think as women and also as um, <clears throat> uh, in terms of BME or whatever the phrase, the global majority, whatever the phrase, I think what I get frustrated is the conversations I hear behind closed doors of like, oh, we won't give them a, you know, are they ready for that opportunity? It's this, it's this lack of, uh, and yet the same, and often sometimes I go, I go, but you wouldn't even have that same question to a young, inexperienced white male director or whatever so we've got to sort of stop that kind of uh, paternalistic colonial thinking that is like are they ready yes and, and even if they're not ready that's okay because there's a lot of mediocre white men in the in our industries but they're allowed to operate and it's it's that allowing it's it's allowing of uh, mediocrity rather than the fact that if you're a woman or if you're a person of color you have to be brilliant because we don't, it's like, when are we going to, and also when are we going to be allowed to be artists rather than politicians or politically active in a way that our white counterparts or our male counterparts are allowed? And I think, I think we also, you, we need to diversify. The diver, diversity needs to go beyond who you are and what role you have. It's to do with the programs that we, we uh, initiate the, 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 the way we deliver our programs, the audiences we work with, the conversations we have. It, 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 it's right through. It's not just about, it's not just a pipeline of people. It's about behavior systems, histories, values, et cetera, et cetera, because you can't be what you can't see. So how can you diverse, how can you create entry routes into the industry for young, uh, black women if they can't see the creativity of their peers in those institutions. These two things go hand in hand. And the idea of, you know, women or people of colour being a risk, you know, that that's there in the publishing industry, that's there in you know, main stages in the West, and the, certainly the West End. So that, that sort of besmirched by, you know, you're risky, you're risky. And, you know. and also acknowledging what it is that you're asking and offering. Right. You know, I think so often, you, you know, it's it's interesting you're talking about quotas, the idea of like, oh, this is a quota and you go, this is avoiding having the conversation about why people not might not be stepping into this space, not feeling welcome. If they do step into that space, how vulnerable they they are, how little true support there is, because as you say, 
the just the currency of the environment mm. is so alien and so racist sexist you yeah. know it just is so actually understanding the harm that can be done by so many assumptions that we bang into all the time yeah. thanks uh, let's get on so so we, we've got a question from francesca clayton who says what would you say is the best approach in performing operas and other theater works that hugely undermine women so pretty you sort of touched on this Mm -hmm. But, you know, you said you, you play roles, those, those traditional roles differently. Yes, and I think it's, it's, it, it goes hand in hand. I think it's a creative uh, kind of approach because ultimately I've come to understand that creativity never stops. The piece can be the same, but the mere fact that the, act, the actors are not the same brings newness in that. And as I have been very fortunate to even seeing repertoire that there are not many people who look like me seeing that kind of repertoire. So it brings another type of um, possibility because this is what the creative space uh, allows us as human beings to express differently and to, 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 have, to find joy in, 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 in these ways of storytelling. Mm. I think, can I just jump in? Yeah. There, which is, mm. I think, also, you know, you think about repertoire like something like Kazi, um, and it, surely the point that you start with with a piece like that is accepting that it's difficult, accepting right. and discussing there are complexities. I think so often the the very beginning of a project and the the, the seed of an idea, you go, why are we telling this story? Is it about beauty? Is it about what what's the, what's the conversation now? in this moment with doing a production of that piece that on face value is incredibly misogynist, but actually it still has value, but what we can't do is pretend it's not. That's right. what I yeah. think is so frustrating. Hmm. Yeah, I t I sorry, Francis. No, I was just agreeing. Okay. No, I totally agree. I think there's a difference between consciously examining that work and why you're, you know, exactly what Paulie was saying, and also, we, we, we use art to explore, to understand, to engage, to, to understand who we are now. It's when, it's when we ignore that and we pretend it's not there, that that's, that's where I personally have an issue with, but I have no problem with like trying to excavate and understand where that piece of work is coming from and where it, where it lies in relation to who we are now. I think what, what, what's so interesting about there's a, a direct parallel with the rethinking of the history of art. That history, there's no point to history unless we tell it from the present. Exactly. You know, there's, there's a purpose. It's just like, uh, it's, it's actually an undifferentiated mass of stuff, history, and it's there for us to retrieve and, and learn, take from it, and enrich our lives and think, you know, move on to the future. And it's exactly the same in art history. And that's why even the old fashioned patriarchal art history still has a point to it because we can retrieve it and reuse it. Wonderful, thank you. And, and let's get it through. There's a, there's a, let's take a final question. I know we're slightly over time, but um, let's get Juliana Toronto's question in. How many women overcome, how can women overcome negative comments and actions on stage in technical workforce and producing teams. Mm. Uh, so a few of you mentioned that vitriol, that, you know, the scrutiny of appearance. How can that be negotiated? <sighs> Turn off your social media channels. That's what I say. Don't yes. listen. I re we've got to protect yeah. ourselves. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I do think it's interesting that actually the overt sexism that I grew up with you know, working on stage and backstage. It, it, there's much, there's less of that now, but actually uh, I think that's worse. I think it's more difficult to battle the sort of deep rooted, unsaid, implied uh, um, aggressions. And that's, that's sort of where we are at the moment, which is, you know, we've moved on from it being kind of, I mean, you still come across blatant, you know, the reason I don't experience it less is because I'm quite old now. Do you know what? But, but it's still very present. But it is the un, it's the unsaid and implied, which I think is the far more dangerous and does more harm. 
you know, I think we've just, we're just getting into the meat of it and it's over. And I, I feel um, it's been so fruitful and rich and thank you. I, I, you know, I do want to thank you. I want to thank you, everybody who asked a question. I want to thank a, a brilliant panel, um, Paulie Constable, Francis Morris, Indu Rubasingham and Priti Yende for, for, for all those insights. Some of it's been depressing, not all of it. Um, we have no action plan, but, but there is, there are strategies there. You have thrown us morsels. Um, and I think this, this discussion is a wonderful, but one, but, but I hope it's continued. So, so I can only say thanks to you, to the audience as well. As I mentioned, the Royal Opera House has a whole week of activity celebrating International Women's Day with stream performances and interviews. You can check the social media. I know you said to bin it, Francis, but it does have its uses. <laughs> Do ch check social media for that. Um, Thank you everybody ever so much and good night.